Hey guys, welcome to my new podcast, Getting Chatty with Platy. Now the idea of this podcast is that it's going to be a multi-platform series, sometimes uploaded to YouTube, sometimes even just an IG live, talking to people I have a genuine interest in, and not just in the online business space, but people from all walks of life, ranging from elite academics to compelling authorities within their field of expertise. Now, what I'm going to try and do is cut the shit from regular mundane podcasts where the same generic questions are asked. And what you're really going to listen to today is two successful people having a chat about life and business. Now we're now on Apple Music and Spotify too, so make sure you subscribe on those platforms. And before I introduce our guest today, there are a lot of ideas that me and my team have at the moment correlating for future podcasts. And what I really want to know is who else you want to see on Getting Chatty with Platy in the future. And we want to implement some sort of challenge or maybe a range of challenges to keep the show fun. So if any of you have any ideas, comment down below if you're on YouTube or send some ideas to at Jordan Platten on Instagram. So guys, today's guest. Today I am joined by David Meltzer. He is the co-founder of Sports One Marketing and the former CEO of Lee Steinberger Sports and Entertainment. David became a millionaire just nine months out of law school and then by the age of 32 had acquired a net worth of over $100 million. That's big. (laughs) He has a personal mission to empower over 1 billion people and it's safe to say he's developed a huge personal brand through 30 years in the sports industry. David, thank you so much for being here. Are you ready to get chatty with Platy today? I am ready as ever, my friend. Thanks for having me on. Love it, love it. It's great to have you here, man. Now, before we get into some questions I have for you today, could you quickly introduce yourself to the viewers? Yeah, so uh, my name is Dave Meltzer and, you know, have been an entrepreneur since I graduated law school, started my career in technology, worked for West Publishing. We sold that for $3.4 billion in 1995. I then pursued a career in the Silicon Valley, raising hundreds of millions of dollars, ending up being the CEO of the world's first smartphone. I'm so old in 1999, they didn't call them smartphones. They called them convergence devices because it converged the phone with the computer. Uh, And then from there, became an entrepreneur, an investor, an angel investor, real estate, stocks, uh, technology companies, and somehow through kismet and coincidence, I ended up the CEO of the most notable sports agency in the world, as you mentioned, Lee Steinberg Sports Entertainment. Most people know Lee from the movie Jerry Maguire. They had uh, Cameron Crowe followed Lee around and built the movie about our firm. There's where I met Warren Moon, the Hall of Fame quarterback. We spun off Sports One Marketing over a decade ago to specifically make a lot of money to help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. But as you mentioned, the last three and a half years, I've built my own personal brand after helping a gentleman named Gary Vaynerchuk with his sports agency. He helped me to understand that although I'd be the oldest Instagram uh, personality and digital media uh, personality that he felt that I had the capability to do so. So I now have a platform which I use to empower others, to empower others to be happy, create a collective consciousness through my podcast, The Playbook, TV show Elevator Pitch. I have a new TV show on Bloomberg called Two Minute Drill. I have books. I do executive coaching. I have private groups. I have lives. I do as much as I can for free to help other people help other people to be happy. And that's why I come on here to help share those lessons and stories to help people have the right perspective to make money, help people and have fun themselves. I love that, David. I love that. My, my, I've always said, I've always said to everybody in my audience that my vision is to give more away for free than other people have you pay for. And, and that's the only way I built my brand. To, I mean, we, we've got a, a respectable 120,000 subscribers. Love you all. Uh, but that's only happened within the last year and a half because we are prepared to give more value than other people will have you pay for normally. Now, do you remember when it is that you first decided that you wanted to make your focus, how you could provide like real value to help other people be happy. Was it something you always wanted to do in business or was there a shift in your mindset and attitude towards giving back? Well, it was staged, right? I believe in evolutions, not revolutions. (laughs) And so for me, even though I did, like you said, lost over a hundred million dollars in it, that could have been revolting, Um, but it wasn't, it was evolutionary. For me, 20 years ago, I started training people. And what I thought, I had loved Napoleon Hill, learned the lessons of think and grow rich, of elevating others to elevate myself. My expertise 20 years ago was strictly really in sales. So I trained people on Fridays for free in sales. My business model was always the same as yours. Pick and see what other people are doing and Mm -hmm. see if I can do it for free. And that was my model. So 
sales training was something that people were offering me thousands and thousands of dollars to do. But I invited everyone to come in every Friday from around the community and the country, and they would fly in for free sales trainings. But that has evolved to much more than sales. I do ego training, worthiness training, pitch training, <laughs> sales training, scaling a business training. But for 20 years, every Friday, I've been doing it. And now that we have this great opportunity where people are accelerating the learning curve of how to use a virtual platform to get together. My trainings have gone from, you know, just a meeting room to a stadium, you know, now to millions of people. Uh, it's the number one downloaded on Spotify uh, of all my podcasts now, which, you know, I have Brett Favre today, for example, yeah. my training will outdo yesterday on Monday, my training, because that's when we post the replays, my training will outdo Brett Favre two to one. Wow. And that's how much people want to learn for free. I'm coming for you, David. I'm coming for that. <laughs> please, please. No, I, no, I, I love it. I love it. And, and, and it's, just, it's just giving value in every area that, that, that you can possibly give. And I think that's just the, the most ultimately fulfilling thing that you can do in life. I know you mentioned, you mentioned about losing a great sum of money. And I want to touch on that. You're probably tired of talking about that to people. But Never. I know you mentioned on, 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 time, on Thrive Time Show that your ego was a major factor as to why you lost a lot of money in 2008. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Have you got any advice for maybe newly, because there's, there's this huge culture now, now of young, successful people and the ego, like we are so susceptible to the ego. And so have you got any advice for like newly successful people about keeping their ego in check or techniques that you use on grounding yourself? Yeah. So number one, asking for help. Where I started, you know, my downfall, my self-sabotage, the scarcity that exists, that there wasn't enough uh, and I break it down into three worlds. I grew up in a world of not enough, like many people who, let me just tell you, if you're in a world of not enough, feel glad because you can't teach someone what it's like to live in a world where there's not enough food, not enough money, not enough parents, not enough house. I had not enough. What you don't want to be is a victim though. And, and so that's a world of everything's happening to me. Why can't I have this? Why do they have this? It's a comparison world that sucks your joy. Then I made millions of dollars, nine months out of law school, and I lived in the world of just enough. And this was the world of ego, buying things you don't need to impress people you don't even like. Uh, it's the money buys happiness uh, philosophy. And what I always say is money doesn't buy happiness, but in the world of more than enough, where I learned to live now, money allows you to shop. And if you shop for the right things in the world of more than enough, if you allow things to come through you, not for you or to you, but through you for others, you will be happy. And so I've lived the lesson of humility. And the lesson that I would give everyone is, hey, the easiest way to get what you want is not do it yourself. Now, you need to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of your potential. you got to give that effort, apply the law of Goya, get off your ass. But more importantly, it's easier to be more interested than interesting. Find someone that sits in the situation you want to be in and ask for help. You cannot ask enough. You cannot ask big enough. And you, not, and you cannot out ask the universe. I'm out here inspiring people to ask and find the people that have the knowledge. I always joke around, you know, I could offer everyone in the world free training that I'll pay their federal and state uh, income taxes and, and people would flock to my free training if I guaranteed that. I'm guaranteeing something that's way more valuable. I'm gonna pay your dummy tax. If you come to my free trainings on Friday, if you listen to my podcast on Mondays, the download of that, of that training, I'm paying something that's way more valuable quantitatively, dummy tax. And I'm not the only one willing to offer to pay your dummy tax. So many people out there, if you just ask for help, are willing to pay your dummy tax too. So giving people something in return is a, is a big thing for you, but get, getting that, getting those people in, luring them in with something a little bit. Okay. I, I like it. I like it. Um, David, just, just before we go off topic, I want to, I want to bring it back to the, the ego thing, because one thing you mentioned there was about like the materialism. And, and I think, I think maybe I've got like a, an unorthodox opinion on materialism, because I think that, and I'd, I would like to know your opinion on it. I think that when people have early on success, I think it's important for them to experience a little bit of materialism because if it's running through your mind, for example, like the cars and, and the houses and things like that, without being at the self, the detriment of yourself, without bankrupting yourself, 
although the majority of the time we are doing that for the benefit of people we don't actually care about. And I fully agree with you in that sense. But it's almost one of those things where it's like, it's a bit like your parents telling you you can't do something. And it's then you have to do it yourself and experience it and actually have that mindset shift yourself before necessarily you then realize that materialistic things aren't going to be the thing that make you happy. Would you agree with that? 100%, but I take it to even a farther level. What I learned, because I always tell people, you want a Ferrari? I'm not telling people don't buy a Ferrari, right? If you want to experience that, then get a Ferrari, learn from it. And if, you, if it really makes you happy, hold on to it. Some, some people, those cars really do make them happy. But I also add another component is I, I believe we live in, in two worlds of currency. One is faith. Faith is a currency that you put into the, it's an object of energy that you put into the flow of the universe to get what you want. But money is a currency. It's an object of energy you put into the flow to get what you want. So use your money to get what you want, but have the perspective that you're getting it to learn from it. And you hold on to what feeds you. In other words, that makes you feel good and get rid of what bleeds you. That doesn't make you. So a lot of times people like me, I was buying things to be happy, not to learn. I was buying different things to be happy, not to learn. I was buying more things to be happy and not to learn and to impress people that I didn't even like instead of, hey, I want to learn what it's like to drive a Ferrari, to own a Ferrari. And if you take that perspective, a lot of times you can buy things that other people think are outrageous. And you know the difference in these people that are empowered because the guys who buy Ferraris or Bugattis and end up selling them and making more money than other people make in a lifetime, they understand the idea of lessons, learning from what you're doing and the experiential side of it, and really being more interested than interesting. So instead of just buying a Ferrari to look good and think you're cool and to expose your anatomy to girls, you know, what you really want to do is figure out the business behind a Ferrari, what they're really like, put your energy, your attention and intention for the coincidence you want. And so I actually, after I had my first Ferrari, which was all ego driven, I bought another Ferrari for business and mm -hmm. I flipped it and made a lot of money because I learned. And the funniest thing about the second Ferrari is I had uh, teenage daughters at the time. I still do. Uh, but they wanted all to drive it. They wanted to do all that. And for me, it was just a business transaction of selling and buying. <laughs> nice. And that, that's, that's the thing people don't understand about cars. Is like, I've, I've got a Porsche uh, in the garage. And, and a lot of people will say, and this is a Porsche came in GT4. So a GT car, right. track version, they hold their value. And people say like, hey, why didn't you get like an R8? Or why didn't you get like, I mean, my next buy is, is a 458 Ferrari. That's, that's the next. And again, a car which is going to hold its value. It's actually, you might actually make a little bit of cash on it if you don't drive it too much. But this Porsche I've had for two years now. And it's like, I think it's, it, it's, it's depreciated 1,000 pounds over that period, but I put 20,000 miles on it. And so yeah. I would much rather buy a car, which I can both enjoy, but then also not lose cash. Cars, if it, that interests you away from ego, doesn't have to be a really poor decision unless you're like financing the thing up to, to your neck. Look, subprime lending in America went from houses into luxury items. And so if the economy does dive, you know, where subprime lending exists, exist opportunities to buy low and sell high. One of those areas are gonna be luxury exotic cars mm -hmm. and they're gonna get crushed because there's people that have borrowed bad debt against yachts and luxury cars and motorhomes and all these items. And I've just gathered up my cash to come in and swoop things on a dime for a dollar because everybody knows there'll be plenty of people when the economy heats back up with big egos that are going to want to pay extraordinary amounts of money for baseball cards and exotic cars and all times of things like that. <laughs> all this stuff comes back. It may drop, but it always comes back. Like you just, as as you haven't lost money until you sell the thing. Do you know what I mean? Like you sit on it, it's going to come back up. I tell people I got in trouble. So here's the difference between audiences because you are spreading out on more platforms, extremely popular on YouTube and building all these other brands. I put up the same video on TikTok and Instagram. On Instagram, it's one of my most popular ones. It says money doesn't disappear. And it's exactly what you're saying. It's the difference between real value and perceived value, mm -hmm. right? And you need to understand. I always say, when you ask for a gift, when people say, what do you want? Ask for real value. And when you give a gift, give perceived value. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing. So, but on TikTok, you know, the audience isn't quite as sophisticated, so they didn't understand the difference between real value and perceived value. So you're like, that's stupid. Money disappears. My car was worth $2 million. Now it's worth $1 million. Where's that million dollars? I said, no, 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 no. 
That's perceived value, right? Yeah. Your car is worth what you bought it for and what you can sell it for. Exactly. Money doesn't disappear. Perceived value always disappears and it grows and extends. When you live in the world of reality, you can make money by buying low and selling high and reverse engineering the buying process. I tell people all the time, especially with the internet and data, there's so many opportunities to find things like your car today. I could go take your car and I could tell you exactly what I could sell that car for. I could figure that out in pretty much minutes. And if that price, I could come to you, let's say I could sell your car for 60 grand and I know I could sell for 60. I could come to you today and say, hey man, I'll give you 50,000 cash for your car. If you take it, I just made 10 grand. Yeah. And people don't take advantage of the data that's available for them. No, a hundred percent. And there's, and you're always going to take advantage as well. Of those people that number one are panic buying or panic selling as well. Like there's, that's always going to be that going on in the market. David, you mentioned um, TikTok that you, you've been using. How are you finding TikTok for business? It's, it, it's um, interesting. That's just put it that way. Uh, TikTok's <laughs> not aligned. Most my, my spectrum, I call it yeah. is not completely aligned with TikTok. Uh, so there is a business unit within there, an inspirational unit within there. Um, but it's not nearly, I, I have a family friend, a daughter who we started on her TikTok in my backyard and she looks like Amelia, whatever, but she has like 7 million followers dancing and mouthing music. Yeah. Dave Meltzer doesn't dance or am I going to lip sync music for anyone? Uh, but I will tell you, uh, it, well, people lose concept and please listen to me because I know you have 150,000 subscribers and growing. 1,000 people is powerful. Yeah, 100%. Right? right, like people, I'm old. So I, I have true value of the amount of an audience if they really are ambassadors of yours. So I used to travel across the country. They pay me $25,000 and I would be super excited to stand on a stage with 500 people. Mm -hmm. And from those 500 people, I'd be able to empower them and change lives and do all these great 500 people all the way across country. They pay for my flights, 25 grand for an hour, an hour and a half. People lose sight today, right? I go on an IG Live, get 2,000 people every morning. Mm -hmm. That's bigger stages than I used to step on. <laughs> and yeah. I don't, you know, yes, I am not being paid a salary, to, you know, or, or a speaking fee to, to step on a live. But ironically, I, I value my ambassadors. I value each and every person. And I would do it for 10 people. Hundred percent, and that's that's when I started my brand, and I was like trying to explain to people like the the, the world of like micro influencers is so like relevant right now. Like micro influencers, in my eyes, are and by that I mean somebody let's say with between one and twenty thousand followers or something like, or even one in ten thousand. You have so much more hold and influence over that small captivated audience because you're new and you're interesting and you're so much more relatable as well to these guys. When you're when you're a little bit smaller, if when you when you start hitting like the millions and millions and millions of followers, albeit that's an, a different power of its own, you have to change the way that you do things. You have to change the way that you hit those audiences. You have to be a lot more tactical. But with those smaller audiences audiences they can be incredibly powerful and that's what i always preach how every business owner out there no matter what industry you're in should be building some kind of personal brand because ultimately this is the best source of exposure and organic traffic that you could possibly get um, and the easiest way to be able to getting that and it's, it's just an absolute no-brainer for people to be doing that and they certainly shouldn't be looking down on smaller audiences or people with, and actually I, I would stand by the fact that the guys with small audiences put out higher quality content than the guys with millions of followers all day long. Yeah, like, you, look, they're trying to impress. you don't have to be as repetitive. I agree, amen is all I have to say to that. And I teach people that. I said, when I started with Gary Vaynerchuk in our space, you know, genius, and Gary was blessed to help me. And he said, well, how many followers do you want, Dave? I said, I want two ambassadors in one year. He said, what? I said, I have a 20 year plan. I'm 50 years old. I was turning 50 right at the Super Bowl there. I mm -hmm. said, I want two ambassadors. He's like, what's an ambassador? I said, I want two people that will send two people every year to all my stuff. You mm -hmm. gotta listen to Dave Meltzer. You gotta watch his TV show. You gotta go live with him. All the Dave Meltzer stuff. And he said, really, that's it? I said, yeah, because when I'm 70, 20 years from now, if two people can get me two people every year, I'll go from four to eight to 16 to 32 exponential math tells me the permeation of two is 2 million people getting me 2 million people when I'm 70 years old. I'll be one of the most popular 70 year olds with 2 million ambassadors. Yeah. He, he's like, bam. I go, that's where I'm going. And guess what? All I can do is get better at accelerating that. So it's taken me a lot less time in three years 
you know, I'm supposed to be at 16 ambassadors. I got a lot more ambassadors, but I'm keeping that standard of ambassadorship. I've always learned in sales when I did the sales training, I don't sell to anyone. I sell through people. Mm -hmm. And then I reverse engineered that philosophy in my life. I want to receive through me. So instead of giving to receive, which is a great notion, I learned to receive so I can give, which opened up my worthiness and my energy to feel good about what I was receiving because I knew the purpose of what I was gonna do with what I received. So I sell through people and receive through me for other people. Yeah, 100%. So it's just an ever-growing chain. Yeah, exponential. Yeah, and it's, and, it's, and it's the same with like, when you build, it's the way we teach in marketing for our clients and for our, we have an academy that teaches people how to start marketing agencies. And it's like, you, the end goal doesn't finish when you gain a customer or when you gain a follower. If you want to turn that customer into a promoter, someone who's going to tell all their friends, all their family, and then in turn, it's this spider web that just keeps growing on its own. Uh, David, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this chat and I'm really, I, I want, but I want to, I'm conscious of time because I know you've only got five minutes left and I want to bring it back to a couple of questions I've got for you. One that I think will be really, really beneficial for this audience. Um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, you've got a, have you got a business partner called Warren Moon? Yeah. Ho- yeah. Ho- so, so you, you work with Warren and, and I would love to know how you complement each other and what you personally look for in a business partner. Because I imagine you've gone through this process quite a lot of times. And for new start business owners, certainly for me, when I found my partner, Joe, it was very hard to because people look for a replica of themselves. And so, yeah, what do you look for in terms of characteristics, goals and things like that? Well, anyone knows Warren Moon or looks at Warren Moon's know he's definitely not a replica of me. I'd, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be happy if he was. Um, so number one thing I look for is the number one common denominator, which is the spirit of excellence. The spirit of excellence encompasses, number one, the desire that you must be what you can be. Two, radical humility based off of gratitude, forgiveness, and accountability. And so, you know, getting to know Warren as a client and as a partner at Lee Steinberg, where, you know, Lee and him were friends since he was in high school, because he went to the same high school as Lee when Lee was an agent. And so Lee had his eye on Warren Moon since high school. And, you know, understanding, you know, any strength that you have put into a different place is a weakness. A weakness someone else has put into a different is a strength. I've been blessed because number one, my wife, compliments me in the exact same way that Warren Moon did. That Warren taught me, I was very hyperactive. He's very calm, right? (laughs) Warren is very humble. You know, he didn't have to project his insecurity. He knew who he was and he taught me to know who I was, to find my own frequency, to build my own brand. One of the things that attracted me to Warren the most, and then we'll go to the next question, is really simply, he said one time at my first meeting, he said, hold on, I don't understand that. Dave, explain to me what that word means and what you're talking about. And I said to myself, this guy's more interested than interesting. He said, I hope I don't bother you, but my mom told me if I don't know something that I need to ask and figure it out, I I don't just let things slip by me. And I'm like, this is a good partner to have. Yeah, somebody that compliments, It's, it's very interesting. Warren sounds like my Joe. Joe is I'm 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 you. I'm up in the I'm I'm up in the clouds, right? We, I like it up here though. I'm cool with it. But we need someone to bring us down a little bit sometimes. We need someone to keep us. They call him <laughs> uh, they call him QB because he plays quarterback in America, right? He's the most yeah. famous quarterback. They call him QB one Kenobi. <laughs> like it, like yeah, it. That's how wise he is. <laughs> Warren, um, la- uh, David, sorry. Last thing, um, if you could give your younger self three pieces of advice, and and this kind of goes against the cut the normal shit from mundane bod- podcast, but you've you've, you've been around, you've 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 done your shit, and you've 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 built a lot of success. If you could give your younger self three pieces of advice before starting out, what would that be? Well, you know, it has to be around the humility side of things. I am telling you that not only ask people how you can be of service or value, but learn this question, Dave Meltzer. Do you know anyone that can help me? And I tell, say it in person on the phone via email if that was available then and now today, media, radio, print TV, social media. But I am telling you, my life would change. And then the other thing I tell myself is you don't know what you don't know. You know, Mm -hmm. I want you to pursue knowing more, but I'm just going to tell you right now, the more you pursue that you want to know and the more that you will know, the one thing that you'll know is that you don't know what you don't know and there's more to learn. And when we know that you can be happy where you are today, angle to something better and have faith that you're going to end with somewhere better than that, that pain is just an indicator. It's not a stop sign. It's a turn signal turning you in a direction to something better, a better situation or make your situation better. 
Be happy where you're at. You're at the right place at the perfect time. Angle to where you want to be and have faith that you end up somewhere better. That's what I tell myself. Amazing. Guys, follow this man's advice. Uh, David, we've got one minute left. You mentioned you've got a, a free training every Friday. Where can people join that if they want to join that free training and, and learn some stuff please, from you? Please email me directly, david at dmeltzer.com. Free trainings. The replays are on Spotify, on Entrepreneur. I'm featured on both. You can find me easily at David Meltzer on Instagram, David Meltzer everywhere else, YouTube, LinkedIn, et cetera. David at dmeltzer.com. Reach out. I'll give you my books for free, exercises, guides for free. I'm like Jordan. You know, if I can afford to give it to you for free, I'm not going to charge you for it. If it's free, it's me. Now it's for you too. Thanks so much. Amazing. Thank you so much, guys. David, thank you so much for being here. This is David Meltzer getting chatty with Platy. I hope you've enjoyed it.